Ahmed. So we are recording, but I hope that you can still engage. So thank you everyone so much for coming to this afternoon's town hall. This town hall is actually a really big deal. So I'm so glad that everybody could make the time to join us. And it's a pretty busy time with finals, but it's definitely going to be worth your while because we're creating something really special here. And so it's a really big opportunity to really shape your student union. So thank you so much for coming. And before, and I also want to begin by acknowledging that the University of Regina Students Union is situated on Treaty 4 lands with a presence in Treaty 6. These are the, these are the territories of the Nahiawak, Anishinaabek, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Ursu also acknowledges the harm that is was done and is being done to Indigenous people through colonialism and systemic racism in these territories and all other territories in Canada. Ursu commits to continue working towards reconciliation and respect and value the land that we are on. As a student union, Ursu recognizes the need to empower Indigenous members in their endeavors while also working towards untangling the implicit structures on campus and in our communities that create barriers towards reconciliation. So if you're calling in from a different treaty, or if you'd like to just reiterate um, the statement about Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 lands, you can definitely throw that in the chat. But with that, we'll get into a little bit of housekeeping. So please keep your mic muted throughout the session um, and obviously unmute when you're speaking. And so if you're wanting to say something, you can just raise your hand um, in with the little zoom function or maybe on camera if I can see you like that. But raising your hand with the zoom function would be the best. And I'll and then when you're given the floor, uh, you can begin speaking then. And again, this meeting is recorded. So um, make adjustments as you feel fit to make sure that you're comfortable to engage. And uh, this is not gonna be a debate. Um, so it's just a discussion among members and our main goals are to like get your feedback and ideas so we can implement it in our governance review. And we really, really value your opinions and perspective. And I'm sure that all of your fellow members also value them. So we'll just keep this uh, discussion um, a bit lighter, a bit more fun. And so then everybody can be comfortable sharing. So um, we do have a couple of slides here. Um, would we be able to share the town hall agenda? just to have a little look at what the rest of the time will be like. Okay, so um, we got through the welcome message and land acknowledgement and the housekeeping announcement. So we are gonna be doing a project introduction. So, so the Ursu Governance Master Plan, um, I'm really glad to present this to our members. Uh, we started this project on the 20th of November. And so this master plan is a project that's gonna have lots of different layers and lots of different phases. And it's going to update the governance structures and documents of our organization. And um, before we get too far into it, I'd also like to um, introduce Teif, if he wants to turn his camera on just momentarily. Um, he's being a very helpful multitasker right now, but Teif has been absolutely integral in completing this process. And so if you are gonna be booking a consultation later on, you'll also be meeting with Teif. And Teif, do you mind giving your a uh, short introduction of yourself and your experiences? just so we can put a face. For sure. In. Yeah, go Thank ahead. Thank you, Hannah. Um, hi, everyone. So uh, my name is Taif Ahmed. Um, I work as a research and uh, policy analyst at the University of Regina Students Union. I also work ARPARC, um, which you are probably more familiar with. Um, I study human justice and political science at the University of Regina. Previously, I went to law school, uh, but I couldn't finish. I ended up um, having, and after doing third year, I moved here um, for undergraduate and after all, I'll, I'll go to the law school probably next year or to the 2023. 
Um, but I've been uh, with the student movement and students union uh, for over six years now. And uh, I'm very excited to work with this project and then um, bring some great, great solution to the works of governance and then uh, offer you a better kind of union. And I'm very excited to work with Hannah and another team such as um, a governance committee and then also um, executive and management. So thank you for coming here. Um, I would uh, I would be very busy to take some notes. So if I don't interact with you opening my cameras, please do not mind. Um, I'll, I'll try to, uh, you know, uh, be respectful to your time. Thanks so much, TF. Um, so uh, TF has been doing lots of great work. And so I guess we'll uh, discuss our process a little bit. So there's going to be three stages. Uh, so research, which has been ongoing the last um, for a couple months now, actually, and then we'll be doing consultation. And this is where you play a really big role as members. And then at, for the last stage, we'll do, be doing analysis. And so the first two stages are done by designated staff and committees and our members, but then the work was, will be presented to our board of directors, as well as to the memberships. And uh, the research will be done to explore our options, to really look at our governance gaps and faults and um, figure out the effect and effectiveness of certain elements of our board governance. And we'll also be uh, considering other uh, governance structures and nonprofit organizations um, in the student union field to make sure that we kind of align with the industry as well. So going forward, Um, you're probably wondering why do we even have to do this? Um, so there's lots of reasons that we are doing this. And um, so it's work that's long overdue. And so we haven't had this type of governance review in 28 years. So that is more years than I am old. So this uh, governance work is long overdue. And also in the 2018 annual general meeting, this was mandated by our membership. So getting this done is really important. So talking about our project objectives, like what are we hoping to accomplish? It's I hope simple and straightforward, but we're looking forward to seeking recommendations for our directors and memberships in areas uh, like governance and the model or structure, the board, organiza board organizational structure, making changes to our governing documents as the governance model and organizational structure change. And most importantly, a new set of articles of incorporation that are to be restated. So by the end of the project, we're also looking forward to creating more opportunities for our members to learn about student and board governance. And if our recommendations are ratified uh, through special resolutions by membership, we're going to be creating a governance guidebook that can really explain all the bylaws and rules and make sure that our members and directors can interpret these. So we'll go to objective one, uh, just to talk a little bit more uh, for a better understanding. So in this governance structure, we're looking at executives and roles of executives, uh, the governing bodies and elections, the distribution of power, interrelationships, fair representation, and a really important aspect is also the checks and balances between um, departments and between the board and operations. Um, so this is just to keep the union functional. And we're going to be looking at a project timeline here. So phase one started last month. So that was on November 20th, and it's going to be ending on December 15th. So during this time, we've been conducting primary research and consultation. Um, and this con the consultation is including this town hall, and we also have online forums, and we also have one-on-one -on -one sessions that we can uh, engage with members with. And then um, after the holiday break, we will be starting work again on January 1st. And then um, during this phase, we're gonna have another opportunity um, to get members involved. 
And then we're going to be presenting them to the board of directors. Uh, so this is going to have a lot of details and documentation. And um, then if the board accepts the recommendations brought forward by us, um, the board will prepare for a special general meeting. And um, then, so we have been thinking around February 2022, but um, the special general meeting is up to the board's discretion. And so the most important part of this, and I cannot stress this enough, is membership engagement and consultations. So that's why we're here today. And you're going to get this opportunity, but also a few others to um, engage with us and provide all of your ideas and suggestions. And so a lot of you are probably like still, what is governance? And this is still something that I have to wrap my head around as well. So I've been in my role for about seven months now, but what is governance? Kind of why are we doing it? And what does that actually mean? So we're just gonna go over a very brief presentation of what URSU's governance looks like currently. And so we'll get started there. So the overarching kind of governance consideration is the Saskatchewan Nonprofit Corporations Act. And then um, in the orange, we have the URSU constitution. So that needs to fall within and adhere to the Saskatchewan Nonprofit Corporations Act. And um, one note is uh, the URSU constitution is a bit of a dated term. And so instead of a constitution, what we're going to be creating are articles of incorporation. And then based on our constitution, soon to be articles of incorporation, we have a lot of different governing documents. So I'm going to just go into a couple little details about what each of these levels mean. So the Nonprofit Corporations Act of 1995, um, it sets the rules for incorporation and the registration of a nonprofit organization. And um, so nonprofits are organizations that benefit a segment of society in some way. And incorporation actually means creating a separate legal entity. And so everything that we do is in the name of the organization. And so um, this reduces liabilities and also ensures continuity, um, which is especially important for us because there is a lot of turnover as um, executives have, executives and the board have one year terms. And so there's two different kinds of member uh, nonprofit organizations. And so there's a charitable one which um, can has a charitable number and can do that kind of stuff. But we are a membership-based organization. So we carry out activities for the benefit of our members. And uh, we are financed through members, through membership fees uh, primarily. But we also have different um, financial instruments at our disposal. So going forward, I'm going to explain directors a little bit more later. But our current URSU constitution is uh, in compliance with the not is supposed to be in compliance with the Nonprofit Act. Um, but this constitution cannot be superseded by any policies that we currently have. And so what's containing in this and what we're going to be creating or implementing into the articles of incorporation that we're making is uh, the goals of the organization, who's a member, the terms, the rights and responsibilities of officers, and anything to do with elections or general meetings. And this uh, document can only be changed at an annual general meeting or a special general meeting. Uh, so that's what I previously mentioned about us providing um, membership an opportunity to vote on this if it is um, approved by the board. So one more little piece here of background document or in terms of this governance. Um, so these are all of our governing documents and they will be adjusted and updated in accordance with our new articles of incorporation. And we have a lot of them, but actually the university has over a hundred, um, much larger organization with lots of different responsibilities, but these are all of ours that we'll have to be updating and going forward. 
So just a little bit about URSU itself. Um, so uh, we were established in 1964 and we're a nonprofit organization and we're students representing and advocating for other students. And we provide services for students through student fees. We also create a community for students and we also do a lot of advocacy. And so uh, currently in our governance structure, we have four executives. So um, these four executives, um, I'm on the one side there, uh, were elected by our membership. And so uh, three of us had been elected in the general election last year. And that I believe happened in March. And then we took office in May. So we take office for one year. But uh, you'll see a new face here. Uh, Basma has joined us as VP external after our by-election. So Basma will continue on with us until April 30th, but then uh, that position will be up for re-election in the general election. And we all work uh, roughly 40 hours and we have specific portfolios. Um, so you can tell from our titles kind of what we work on, but if you want more details, I can definitely provide that. But we'll talk a little bit about the board now. So uh, we have a really big board of directors, and this is actually pretty unique for a nonprofit organization, but maybe a little bit uh, more in line with uh, other student unions. So we have faculty rep representation, but also special constituency representation. And so uh, lots of different considerations and options um, for representation. Um, I have heard of uh, different student unions having as few as uh, seven on their board, but I've also heard of people having 40 on their board and both of those comes with pros and cons. So as we get to that part of the discussion, we can definitely chat about that. And what does the board actually do? Um, so they supervise and oversees the activities and um, they are accountable to all of you, our members, and our members have elected them to be on the board actually. And they set the high level strategic direction and um, the responsibilities are determined by um, the nonprofit uh, corporations act that I mentioned, uh, the constitution and bylaws and policies. So high level, um, that's what we need to remember the board as being. Um, so they're a supervisor. They're not to get too far into the day-to-day -day operations or be telling people specifically what to do or how to do it. Um, they act in the best interest of the organization and they support the will of the board. Even after um, there is a disagreement amongst the board, the board has one voice overall. And so what do they do? Um, so they direct. So they kind of point in the direction that the organization should be going and they set goals and targets. And so they do this through strategic plans, policy direction, people direction and resource direction. And then the control aspect. Um, after they've set the direction and the operation side has been carrying out certain actions, we uh, the board must check if the organization is following uh, the direction through performance reporting, policy monitoring, and people evaluations. So we're getting to the meat of this. Was there, I just wanted to leave a little bit of time. Was there any questions about what I just covered in terms of our current governance structure? Okay. So with that, um, we can get into the real uh, discussion of this. So feel free to um, raise your hand. But right now, um, we need to consider a couple things. So we'll start on the board of directors side. So a board of directors can sometimes be, um, they're responsible for taking care of the organization overall. And in some situations, this is in a bit more of a, a corporate sense or um, business kind of sense. And 
then a student council is more uh, political and representative. Um, you can think of the city council, and that's how they make decisions that affect um, their members. Does anyone have any thoughts on that aspect? Okay, make sure you raise your hand if you're excited to share anything. So right now, how does the board represent you? I had mentioned the directors that we have currently. So we have faculty representation as well as certain specific constituencies. So in terms of representation, um, we have potential to add positions or remove positions. Eric, would you like to share your thoughts? Considering I'm on the board, it might be a little strange, but um, I think the whole thing with appointments might be kind of something that we should consider because I know in the past there's been a lot of problems with vacant positions and this could just be from a combination of um, people not being aware that the positions are available for them to run for but also I think it's it would be beneficial if we could have some appointments because there's like I mean even the other day we talked about the um, nursing director when was the last time we actually really had a director for nursing so I think it would be good to have the balance of obviously the main election, but also maybe considering some appointments as well. Interesting thoughts. I'm so glad that you brought that up. And so if we have empty seats, I wonder, and I'm just like speaking theoretically, kind of having a fun conversation here, but I wonder if that means we have too many board members, or maybe that means that the elections make the positions less accessible to people. Um, was there, oh, now we have two up. Uh, Eric, can we go back to you? Because I think this might be in relation to the current uh, aspect and then we'll go Keegan. Um, I was kind of the idea you're floating around about like limiting the amount of directors. I mean, it's kind of crossed my mind before but then there's also so many logistical challenges. For example, even like Keegan, you talked about the other day how there hasn't been many people that have wanted to be the director for Luther but then if you lose that voice, then it's kind of, it's it's a disaster for self or for um, democracy itself. Absolutely. Really interesting aspects to consider. Uh, Keegan. Yeah, I would just echo Eric's comments. I just was thinking, um, I also was thinking similar to what he was talking about at meetings that we have together and I think that if we did have um, an opportunity or a discussion for having uh, having elect uh, appointed positions, then I think that that would help accommodate some of the issues with vacancies, like Eric was saying. But I also think that um, I, I gets to a slippery slope when you start taking away position or discontinuing uh, positions, and so. There's a famous, uh, one of the justices of the Supreme Court of England said, one man's justice is another man's injustice. So I think that makes the same point. Like, so some community groups or um, constituencies, like at Luther College might be really upset that you get rid of Luther's college's student position, where another group on campus might not really be affected or necessarily care. So I'm just thinking that if we do go down that route, we need to be really careful of, of not I know we can't like make everyone happy, but I don't think we should right now think of getting rid of uh, positions. I think we should start thinking about um, adding more positions to be more inclusive. Awesome, thank you so much for those comments, Keegan. Um, so I can follow up with that, but I'd love to hear your thoughts, Robin. Hey, so I'm actually the nursing representative today, so I can sort of speak to that a little bit. Um, Sorry, my phone just rang, um, but I think it would be interesting, and this is the first uh, meeting I've ever attended with Ursu, but I think it'd be beneficial if you could potentially like elect people from their own governance, like nursing we have urns, and I think that it'd be easy for us to pick a delegate from urns to be on Ursu versus being elected through Ursu because we have our own election. I just think like 
in my experience, there's like it almost doubles over onto each other and it becomes an issue that way. So I don't know if like an appointing from like another body would be work better and fill the positions easier for you guys. But I, I do like that idea personally. Thanks so much for open. So I am very intrigued by this idea. I think we'd have a couple elections um, kind of hoops to jump through to make sure that everyone's elections were run in like a really free and transparent way um, and ensure consistency. But that's definitely something that I hope we can explore more. And I believe Eric had his hand up first, right? Um, to agree with uh, kind of Robin's point about kind of appointing people through like an election process, I think oftentimes even like, for example, at the moment, the Faculty of Arts usually will always have someone on the board just based on the sheer size of the Faculty of Arts. But I think in the future, if you ever have problems with that, you can always just look to the ASA, which is being revived at the moment, might I add, um, to maybe look for further direction in terms of appointments and stuff like that. And like, even, I wouldn't say you have to have a, it's kind of hard when it comes down to the elections of trying to figure out like, through each like student society or something like that because then i'm not sure the exact clauses in the constitution of who can be appointed to a board but then if it's possible to go through some approval process by um, the board itself that would be very interesting for me to see yes interesting i wonder if there is like an opportunity to say have an ursu election but if then there was no buddy in that position we could do an appointment but we can explore that and Keegan. One last comment on this point and then we can move on, I guess, from uh, just thinking, um, I know the PAC societies and you, Hannah, run and manage those meetings with everybody. And so it'd be really interesting. Um, it would be really interesting having, you know, how the, you know how the university has like a count, faculty council or faculty council and then the university council and then whatever goes on hierarchy. I don't, I don't know if you need to be that detailed, but I just thinking that if that, if that meeting that you run, have all the society and association presidents or whatever, that would be my, that might be an interesting way to try to facilitate or solicit P, uh, individuals who want to be appointed to those vacant positions. Um, so that was just an idea, um, but yeah, that's something we could think about later down the road. Interesting. I am liking the ideas. Um, I do meet with all of the society presidents um, to get feedback, but uh, a stronger connection to our societies would be really important, actually. And I see Style with his hand up. And to answer your question really quickly, sorry, I Ooh, I wasn't watching the chat as closely as I should, but um, we don't have any um, ex officio members of the board. Um, but would you like to elaborate on that or do you have a new comment? Actually say both. I want to hear both. Oh, I can unmute myself. I'm sorry. I was waiting for tech support to cue me. Uh, well, thank you very much, Madam Chairperson. This is a really great opportunity for uh, your constituents to voice their opinions and uh, a huge fan of democracy myself. This is like my forte. This gets me going. So I guess my first point, uh, Madam Chairperson, is I will address the ex officio uh, question. Um, in other organizations that I'm uh, involved in or have been involved in, we uh, encourage the, the uh, appointment of ex officio members mostly to help with the transition of power during election years or um, to kind of keep that knowledge base and that historical base of knowledge continuing throughout um, the, the, the terms. Um, I don't know what it would look like with URSU or, or how that works just simply because the turnover is so high and it may be difficult to get buy-in from stakeholders in our communities to, to stay involved uh, unless we look at faculty or unless we look at um, uh, staff. And then also just a kind of a follow up to that is other organizations I've been involved in usually does have a, a staff appointment uh, as an ex officio member, but I do believe uh, your ED is quite involved. Yes, no, maybe so. Um, we don't have an ED, but we do have a general manager. Yeah, yeah, your, your GM. Okay, mm -hmm. cool, 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 cool. Um, and then I guess, um, so Madam Chairperson, this is less of a question to, to you and a, more or less a question to the directors on the call. So Madam Chairperson, through you, 
um, uh, to the directors on the call, you folks have been talking about appointment and, and inclusivity and keeping uh, as many voices as possible on the board, which I think is fantastic. And uh, you can't get stuff done unless you have all the voices represented. But within that, there's a huge um, lack of capacity that Ursu is struggling with right now based on a directors not being involved as they should and or not pulling their weight that they are uh, you know, constitutionally bound in their fiduciary responsibilities to the board, they're not fulfilling those. And then uh, I guess my third question to the directors on the board would that are on this call would be, um, if the workload is too much and that's why people aren't getting involved, how would you feel about appointing someone to those roles when you're giving someone more work than what they're anticipating? Does that make sense? Am I making sense, Madam Chairperson, through you to the other directors? Sorry, can you rephrase the last part? Yes. Um, uh, if the workload is, is too much that it's discouraging people from running, mm -hmm. the appointment, in my opinion, wouldn't work. So I'm curious to know how the directors would see that working. And I'm asking them because they are hands-on, boots on the ground. They're doing their, their work right now. So, so I'm just trying to figure out how is it um, logical and ethical to be like, yo, you're cool and you're gonna represent the two SLGBTQ kids on campus, even though they're like, yo, I don't have the time. Yeah? Absolutely. Um, I think we have been seeing like just really busy students and like I'm like preaching to the choir. Um, we all know how busy we are, um, but that is definitely a challenge is just like the different workloads. And um, this potentially could link to uh, honorarium discussions. But I also wanted to mention um, in terms of like people willing to run in elections, and I'm just like kind of putting an idea out there, I don't know. But um, we've recently opened up members at large positions. So these were appointments for people on our committees. And in this process, we had a lot of engagement actually. Um, and this was a preliminary program and preliminary initiative. So it wasn't that well known quite yet, but we had a lot of engagement, way more than I thought we would. And I wonder if appointment processes are maybe less intimidating than an election process. And um, like, and um, in my personal studies, like I study political science and business, but in the political side, um, we do see uh, less women running in elections in general, um, and whether that is like a confidence thing or a desire thing, but that's just something like to consider is like, do people want to run a whole election? Maybe that's deterring people, but just like talking and putting ideas out there. Uh, tech support. Um, sorry, it's me, Tef. I can't figure out the uh, raise hand button in my personal computer, so I'm just using the other computer. So um, I would like to give you folks a little bit more um, kind of option to discuss. One option is terms of the board of directors. How do you think um, having um, two years term in, instead of one year? And also, I just wanted to give you another option. How do you think about um, having two options? Like, for constituents like a nursing student association or indigenous relation or indigenous students director, if uh, the position are not filled by election, there is another option, another bylaws that supports having appointment right after the election. Um, so this is another option you can um, discuss about. Thanks so much, Taf. And uh, Eric, if you had a previous thought or something in reply to TAF's question, go ahead. I'm going to try to remember all of the questions that were presented to the board. Uh, Keegan and I are probably struggling with trying to remember all of them. But um, I believe, Style, would you be able to rephrase your last question? Because I was going to answer something on it, but then in my opinion. Yeah, 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 totally. Um, and it probably got lost. Yeah. Um, Madam Chairperson, through you to the board, because I can't actually ask them a direct question, but I'll be, sorry, I'm a political junkie as well, so I'm like loving this stuff. So Madam Chairperson, through you to the board, um, do you feel that uh, an appointment makes sense 
to uh, to people considering that there is uh, lower engagement during the election cycles? And do you feel that the lower engagement is because of the perceived workload of the board? Um, and then I guess another follow-up to that would be, uh, I'll ask the follow-up if you, if you answer these questions. Okay, um, I believe there definitely is a perceived um, uh, perceived sense that the workload is huge. And I think this is just born out of the fact of ignorance based on um, the, just the fact that student engagement is so low at the moment. And I mean, we're even running into problems. I know um, Style mentioned earlier about how um, there's not as many continuing members that are, that are giving their knowledge. It's based on the fact that we're not recruiting younger students and they're not able to share their opinions for longer terms. So when you aim at this demographic that are third and fourth year students, you're obviously gonna have problems within organizations. I know you are polis has more of a, um, they have a direction where they're trying to recruit younger students. I'm not sure how it's going, but that's what direction they're trying to aim for. And I think Ursu needs to try to uh, try to attract younger directors because the actual problems of perceived workloads and things like that are born out of, an, born out of a, a sense of ignorance from the student population. And it's based off of the lack of student engagement. Because if students were engaged and knew what we actually did, they would realize that it's more being a part of the board is more is it's not as it's hard, but it's not as hard as it's perceived to be. But yeah, hopefully that answers some some of what style asked. And I'm gonna take a one little moment to comment on that as well. Um, a lot of our directors and board members, this is one of the first boards that they've ever served on, or maybe they've served on one or two before, but um, on in like other nonprofits or organizations, like directors have 10 years of industry experience and have like a lot of like knowledge on their roles and responsibilities. But Ursu has this, it's like this amazing opportunity for people to actually get involved in like nonprofit governance. So it's a really big opportunity, but it's also like a lot of work to make sure that all of our directors know what to do. And I'm sure we've all had like a job before and it takes you maybe four months to learn how to do your job. Um, and that's an understatement. I've been president for seven months and sometimes I'm like, what, what am I doing? Um, so just learning your job and uh, board members are expected to kind of, we have like orientations and different trainings, but you learn a lot on the job, which I think can increase the burden of work when you're like constantly learning and also doing your job. But um, that might relate a little bit to TAF's question about, say, two-year terms or staggered terms. But uh, Keegan, go ahead. Uh, I'm just reading Styles' comment. Okay. Okay. So um, yeah, I think that two things. Um, one of the things I think I agree. I agree with Eric again about how um, I think that there is this Anne Hannah, but there is this idea, this this idea, romanticized idea of how difficult or how um, challenging being a board member is. And I guess there is some truth in that. But to be frank with all of you, um, if I, I think that, like Eric's saying, if we could work on trying to motivate first year students or younger students to get involved, then I think that's what we should start trying to put our uh, focus on. But I do think um, um, with Taif's comment about a two-year stake or two-year term. I do know, I think, Style, you mentioned that on some of the boards that you're on, you have a two-year term. And so I think that that might be something that we should pursue. But I think one comment I'll make is that it's really hard to motivate people who aren't really motivated themselves. And so you can do all the, you can try to put on these workshops and all these really great initiatives at Ursu, but I mean, it but it, I think it begins with um, the individual board member to want to get involved. And so, so like, for instance, sometimes I, sometimes it's my problem, but sometimes I don't put as enough effort into my role as a leader position. And so I, and I, and so, and sometimes I put more effort in other areas, but I'm just saying that, you know, I think that we have to look at, um, we have to look at that component as well about workload and about if it's too burdensome for students. But I'll just mention 
uh, one thing I was thinking about is, um, yeah. So Hannah, on the on your on your um, on your slide here, you have two things about considering AVP positions, and I think that might be an awesome, interesting opportunity for the board and for student individuals who want to take on some more responsibility on the board or on the or uh, in Ursu. I'm at the board level, but not take all the responsibility as like a president or or um, or VP of external or uh, or student affairs. So I think that might be something I will say. But last comment, and then I'll be quiet for Styles comment about um, I do kind of agree with you about. Um, yeah, so like I wouldn't like it if somebody if if I'm a Luther student and and I found out that Ursu appointed somebody from somebody with no Luther consultation to join, to be on the board, because it's, I would, I wouldn't really like that too. And so same with like being on with the UR Pride or Indigenous Student Center, or I would agree with those kind of really important constituencies, like all of them are important, but I would, I agree with you. I wouldn't really like if, if you, um, if somebody was appointed without, if, if there wasn't really any discussion about that, if it was just kind of given or, or some kind of, uh, process like that. So I think that there, if we do something like that, there needs to be some kind of robust and um, uh, and uh, robust conversation with the faculty or with um, with uh, with the constituents. Like I said, uh, at Luther College and at other and other faculty of arts, for instance, in the history department, and I think in in the political science department like Hannah and Stott, I think you're both our political science majors. Sorry if I forget if everyone else are. But I think that different departments give student, um, send out a call for students to sit on the Faculty of Arts Council, for example. Luther College looks for students to sit, to find students to be a student representative to those different councils. So that, that might, I'm just thinking that if we do something like this representative or this these kind of positions and I would think that those like student centers or those kind of like those kind of student centers or groups would be the kind of go to people to help find people to be on the board. Okay, sorry if I was rambling. No, don't apologize for sharing your thoughts. It's absolutely great. So um, we will go with Eric and then we may move into discussing executives more specifically. Um, but um, after Eric, we can take one more comment on board of directors and then we'll keep moving. Uh, Eric, go ahead. Um, so this is kind of to relate to how we can uh, have a board that represents us better and also kind of the election versus appointment kind of debate, you would rather say, not really a debate, but more of a discussion as you mentioned. But um, talking about how, should we try to look at some mandate that brings in more of a, to look at the composition of the actual board members that are appointed? Because I know there's a lot of problems when you appoint appointments or appointments will lead to uh, a lot of like third and fourth year students getting appointed based on the fact that yes they're the most qualified for the position and things like that but also when you have problems like this and it's just third and fourth year students being appointed in this case if we went for, forward with this what would happen when they have to they leave university and things like that so should we look at some type of um board compositional thing where we have a certain mandate and quota of certain um, years of students in terms of obviously elections you can't um, determine this because if you put your name in you put your name in but in, in appointments I feel like we have um, more control in terms of who gets appointed and things like that and kind of bringing in like a quota of uh, different years of students that's just kind of something to think on perhaps very interesting thought and whether we would say like 10% of the board has to be first year or whether we have a specific first year position or something like that. Um, that would be really interesting because I do, I think we all sometimes forget what it's like to be in first year sometimes. Um, so keeping that connection is important. Eric, you had a follow up? I have something to add. Yeah. And that's what like I'm kind of my main mission on the board this year is to kind of look at student engagement, things like that. And just obviously I'm not an exec, so I don't have really any, it's a different perspective, but that's what I'm kind of looking, uh, that's what I'm kind of thinking of in terms of my perspective of the board and trying to represent, I'm representing art students 
all across the board, but also I have a different, a special place in my heart for first year students, considering that I'm a first year student. So I think um, by looking at some type of mandate or some type of quota of certain amount of appointments, I think we can kind of try to combat these issues of student engagement better, because if we have different mentors within the board and people that are younger, we can pass this legacy on rather than just ending up with a bunch of third and fourth year students that leave uh, university. It's like what happened to the ASA. The ASA was filled with a lot of senior members. And as soon as COVID rolled around and they finished uh, university, the ASA is now in the processes, process of revival based on the fact that it's at the moment, it's not really anything. So it's kind of difficult, but it's just something maybe to think about. Absolutely. And um, I'm going to provide one more comment on, uh, say, like getting people involved earlier on in their university programs. Um, so the member at large position is to help people like get involved and start understanding URSU a bit better. And those are appointments. And we did focus um, on making sure we could get people that would maybe one day be executives as well. Um, and then providing training opportunities through the ULEAD program that we've been working on. Um, so then once people get in those positions, um, they'll know more about what to do. Okay, um, now we're gonna talk about executives. So again, um, so as president, I am an executive. And so while I am still a student, I also work full time. So executives are students that work uh, full time on different portfolios. And currently we have a VP external, a VP student affairs. Zayo's with us today. Uh, so if you have any questions about student affairs, Zayo will definitely be able to help out with that. Um, to be honest, he's kind of an expert. This is second term in there. Uh, but then uh, we also have a VP finance and operations and then a president. And the president um, kind of goes in a lot of different directions at once um, as kind of the, the lead. But full disclosure, um, me and all of the VPs have the same amount of voting power. So while it seems like the president would be like, most in charge, I'm actually not. Um, so <laughs> I am kind of like the public facing, but I don't have any more um, power than the VPs. So just a thing there. So we have a couple of prompt questions there and we are really interested in also hearing about new positions that we could potentially have on the executive team and whether they work uh, full-time or part-time, um, that could be an interesting aspect. So like, and honestly, we can make any sort of executive position that is gonna serve students well. But I might uh, pass it to Taya for a little bit of elaboration and then share your thoughts. Taya. There you go. Um, I will go over some of the things and explain a little bit more what that uh, what all of this mean. Um, so, how can we make executive more efficient? So, in our current uh, governance structure, um, executives are dealing a lot of things, and that includes internal affairs, external affairs, and a lot of lot of responsibilities. To doing that. Um, a lot of time we, we are seeing that executives aren't able to go out there and then engage with the students as much as they would like to, because they're spending most of the time in the office dealing with different issues. Um, so we're gonna talk about that. And then um, since we have started a lot of advocacy department, uh, our student affairs position used to be like advocacy and then student affairs clubs and societies. Right now we're thinking um, how we could um, move some of the responsibilities toward uh, more fun events, uh, student life example, uh, you know, uh, first year students focusing on how, how how they can provide more support to the first year students during exams, um, a lot of events and stuff. Uh, this is something to talk about. And then we have heard, um, uh, so executives are to lead in or, or uh, you know, in each department and each sector. So since we have started our uh, advocacy department, we have hired some uh, folks 
and then we're having some plans for advocacy going forward. Um, so thinking about a um, BP position for advocacy and campaigns and other things to discuss about. And um, in the last year and then previous year, um, we have had a discussion with um, with regards to associate vice president, um, uh, either appointing or electing um, uh, for, from membership or from the board, giving them some opportunity to uh, be familiar with the executive position. And later then if they choose to run, um, it's gonna be a little bit more efficient and then uh, someone running uh, really new and also helps with um, help directly with the executive committee um, 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 with regards to campaigns and different different projects so this is something um, to talk about as well um, so I'll leave it to you to discuss all of these things if you need more explanation about something just let me know I'll be happy to explain more and Thank you so much, Taif. And then one other kind of consideration or potential need for a new executive is um, Ursu actually represents members from the U of R, uh, from Luther, from Campion and First Nations University. So uh, we have members that take classes in Saskatoon and Prince Albert, as well as a lot of people doing like um, online courses from rural or remote areas. So potentially that's an area we need a bit more representation and understanding in. And um, yeah, so any thoughts on what sort of executives we need or what the positions we need are? Style, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairperson. Um, maybe this is a question for you or for the staff on the call. Do we have a breakdown of exactly what our constituents look like? For example, who is rural and remote? How many students are in Prince Albert? Uh, how many of our students are international? And I think from there, it might be uh, easier to break down exactly what the needs and wants of the membership are. Absolutely. So we have a lot of kind of statistical, like demographic type of stuff, but I do think that there's some gaps. But, um, and then with the shift to online and then the shift back to kind of on campus last semester. This has confused um, a couple different aspects because we have remote classes and we have high flex classes and then we have online classes and then in person. But um, if there was someone that had an understanding of some of the demographics and makeup, um, please let us know. And if not, um, we will be looking into that because that's just an excellent thought style, so. Oh, and I see our accountant, Nick, is here. Uh, Nick, can you tell us a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, I can speak to some of um, what we get. Uh, so the U of R does um, charge fees to all the students, and they have limited metrics available to us as far as exactly where someone is studying. Like, we can look at nursing. We rely on um, a lot of coordinator input for those metrics. It, but there, there's like originally we thought that we only had students in several areas like Saskatoon, Prince Albert, Swift Current, but the U of R actually runs courses off campus in many, many small communities across the, the province. Um, it, it has been difficult for us to get the information from the U of R um, that gives us those relevant metrics. And it is something that I think that they are capable of doing but that is a very significant amount of work for them as well. Um, so, you know, obtaining that data is more difficult than, um, than it should be from our perspective, but we do the best we can um, with those metrics that come from the U of R. Thanks so much, Nick. And I guess in the same vein as this discussion, as we're, as the university's like solidifying what their future plans are in terms of course delivery, whether it's gonna be like all in person or high flex or just remote or self-led type of stuff. I think that it is important to consider how we represent students that aren't on campus in Regina. So I think traditionally that's the group that we have served 
I guess, the best. Um, and maybe not so much serving the students that are not directly on the Regina campus. But is there any thoughts on that? Uh, Eric. Um, from my perspective, I mean, there's obviously going to be differences in how we're able to represent people. I mean, in terms of like, there's not a one size fits all approach. And that's the main problem I think we're trying to combat with a one size fits all approach and student engagement and things like that. But um, I mean, in rural communities and things like that, you, they don't even, a lot of the students aren't even able to access the same services that we provide. So obviously representation is gonna be slightly different. But just, I, I mean, Unfortunately, I think at the moment it's kind of an kind of an inevitability. I mean, we can try to mitigate it as much as we can, but it's one of those things that will always exist. Interesting. And potentially there's opportunity for someone with say like more lived experience pursuing remote education to understand and like have a targeted approach or targeted portfolio to those areas. But that's just a potential thing and we're just kind of having a brainstorm. Um, and unless anyone has more to say on that, what would you think about associate vice presidents? Um, so in some sense of the word, um, this would be um, like a vice president um, that could help guide the executives on a part-time basis. So that would remove the need for working, say a full 40 hours. So this could be part-time work and this could be representing like specific um, like groups, uh, like TAF had provided the example of indigenous or international students, but this could also be in the sense of say AVP, um, or associate vice president student affairs. And then in that kind of example or situation, that would be someone who works directly with Zao, um, kind of like an assistant position, um, just helping coordinate, do some research, follow up on things. Um, so a couple different perspectives on the associate vice president. Uh, Eric. I believe that would be a good idea. Um, I think that it shouldn't be built on an approach that kind of looks at it as an immediate response. I mean, as you see fit, if you're in an executive position and you feel like you need to have like more of an associate VP along with you, I think that would be beneficial. But also, I mean, if there's no real need for an associate VP, if the workload in a specific position in a school year isn't insanely an insane amount, I don't think there is a need for it. But in certain positions, I think it's definitely needed. Zeo. Thank you, Hannah. And, and also from a perspective, there should be a, a AVP, like either internal affairs or secretary position to, serve, to make sure to help other exit member with their meeting agenda, meeting schedules, and also like replying, replying some uh, like major emails. Because like from my past terms and the same as uh, Hannah's experience this term, or sometimes we struggle with you know like replying to our member like in emails from our memberships or the emails from some major like organization like university or other external 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 collaborative organizations. It takes lots of time from us like every week. It's usually you know like several hours a week to reply emails or to or just to communicate in the email back and forth. So it's better to have someone you know to to. Uh, manage the email and make sure to help you know to support other exit members with such uh, with meeting schedules. Uh, same as like AVP, maybe northern campuses to have a representative to make sure like uh, to connect with a uh, uh, students in the Sask Saskatoon or uh, or Prince Albert campus. Make sure they are feel connected with the students union. Thank you. And. I'm just gonna take a moment to elaborate a little bit more on what Zeo has mentioned. Um, so for example, um, throughout my day, I'm in say 
maybe like three meetings a day. And then uh, I need to prepare all the materials for that meeting. I need to do the read up on those meetings. Um, I also need to schedule and create agendas for some of those meetings. And then um, I also have to do certain like research and information gathering and student engagement. Um, but then at the end of the day, it comes around to five o'clock and I have 50 new emails in my inbox. And it's not for like lack of trying, because trust me, I try hard to keep up with that. Um, but when you're busy from nine to five, the only option is emails at night. And whether the AVP would write like email specifically or if they would provide different support with agendas or if they would provide provide support with research. I guess that's something that could definitely be discussed more. But um, I do sometimes feel like my job is three or four in one. But thanks for mentioning that, Zayo. Uh, Keegan. Yeah. Um, I think that if you're going, if we're going to do this, like if this is something we want to do, then I think it would need to be paid because to be honest with you, no one's going to, no student will want to do this for free. I wouldn't want to do, like, not that I'm lazy, but I mean, no one wants to just sit around writing emails to everyone. And I know, I know that's part of the job. But I know that that's not what everybody wants just to sign up to do. And so you would need to try to find a way to, um, to make it appetizing for people. So rather than just like, I know Zhao and you, I know Hannah, you were just talking about, these are just some of the things that you might, this position might do. But if you are pitching to me, this idea, if you just pit, if this was a pitch, you would, you failed miserably. Cause I, <laughs> cause I, like I said, um, uh, no one wants to probably write emails. And, and so, uh, so you need to find a way to try to, to, to get this. Yeah. Okay. That could be something we could do, but I mean, I just was thinking that, yeah, that you'd probably have a hard time finding, I, I think you might have a hard time finding students that want to do that position unless there's some kind of incentive. I know we don't like talking about incentives, but I mean, there was some kind of incentive that I think maybe like if you make it more of like a mentoring role or something like that, then you might get more people interested rather, I know you're, I know these are just preliminary ideas, but that is something I thought to mention. Great comments, Keegan. Um, and even like providing students like a way to live their life, like financial means, because if they're giving time to the students union, that means less time working on their other jobs. And like, unfortunately, we just all need money. Um, so that is a big constraint. So every time, say, like, a board member gives up three hours of their part-time job, they're giving that to Ursu. So um, just in that example, so payment is like kind of a touchy subject, but I think it is important that since we're an organization that really strives for equity and fairness, that we also treat our executives or board or staff with um, pay equity and fairness, just because people need to buy groceries, like it's important. <laughs> Uh, go ahead, Eric. Um, I would kind of be intrigued to hear what um, Nick kind of said in the chat about an administrative assistant, because I know like if there's an, uh, an opportunity to even just hire uh, someone in the Ursu staff, I think that would be beneficial as well, just based on like maybe not an elected position rather. So it's not really governance related, but I guess it is governance related, um, but someone that like helps with that. I don't know if Nick would want to talk a little more about that because he seems like he has a very good grasp about it, but. Nick, please do share your thoughts. Sure, I mean, you know, what you are explaining is, uh, you know, monotonous stuff that pretty much anyone could do that takes you away from the important stuff, which is kind of governance related, right? When you're looking at executives and their capacity as students and as technically, well, as employees of the organization, um there it's important that you are as an executive is are able to focus on the important things like meeting with people and providing direction and strategy and all that and if you are tied up with emails scheduling all that sort of stuff then that pulls you away from it and one of the things too is is given our current uh our current uh structure um we do have that turnover right so 
Um, historically, it's primarily being um, the GM that's kind of tried to bridge that gap between the old and the new. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, executive assistant, administrative assistant, you know, they, they, that, that would take kind of care of kind of that admi administrative stuff that doesn't really provide a lot of direct value um, to an executive's day. Um, and I mean, in a lot of organizations, uh, nonprofits, for profits, you do have the executive levels, senior management who have um, administrative assistants or executive assistants for this very thing is to organize their days and allow that person to, to focus the bulk of their energy into things that really matter. Thanks so much for sharing, Nick. Um, I just need to step out for just a couple minutes here, but Teof is gonna lead. Um, but Zeo, if you wanted to start us off. Sure, thank you. Um, basically, I also like executive, executive assistant might be, be also another good choice. But on the other side, if you are having like a, a staff position, long-term staff position to help with the executives, it might, brings out some tensions or sensitivities after a couple of years, because, you know, once a staff member holding too much inf confidential information or related information for long-term, it might bring a, like a, like a, some unstableness for this organization. So I think if we're ready to go for in, going for this direction afterward, it's better to be like, like let this position select, like a final egg selected by the board, which means we'll open the hiring process and, uh, and the final candidate should be made by the board and make sure the contract is not a, is not a permanent contract, which is meaning like a three years or two years contract and it has to be renewed by the board every time. And they, it brings more accountability and make sure it's more safety for this organization in the future. Um, thank you, Zio. Um, thank you, Nick. Uh, also, it's very good to have hear a lot of um, important uh, discussion. Uh, I'll go to Eric, go ahead. Um, a very good response, Leo. Um, I see, I kind of understand your fears with um, like sensitive information and all the confidential stuff maybe unfortunately being transferred. But right now our alternative is losing all this information. So, because I mean, where has the continuity been in the past five years at Ursu? I obviously cannot speak to the past five years at Ursu because I was not going to the U of R at that time. But there's many clauses, I believe, in employment agreements and things like that that will prevent this without putting a, a, a specific term on employment. So maybe I, it sounds like Nick might speak a little further to this because it sounds like he has a little more experience with this. But um, yeah. Thank you. Go ahead, Nick. I mean, that's the case in, in uh, the professional world in general is usually there's, you know, things like confidentiality clauses. And in fact, we do um, get people to sign off on confidentiality when they start with Ursu. So anything that happens at Ursu typically stays at Ursu unless it's out facing. Um, and it's a, just a common expectation of that type of role. Uh, for instance, I, I do payroll, but I don't tell any, any employees about other employees unless they already have that information. Um, and it's, it's just kind of, you know, what you do in business. And uh, uh, so confidentiality from one term to another, um, I think would be addressed through that. I think Hannah is back. Hannah, would you like to lead? Go ahead, thank you. Uh, I'm still, I'm still catching up on whereabouts we are, but ironically, um, I had a bit of an urgent phone call and had to step away, but I appreciate your patience, um, but work, workload balance is what we were talking about when I left, um, but confidentiality, I do like, like professionals know how to be confidential, and if someone's not confidential, they're not a professional, and yeah. But I guess that's my opinion personally. Uh, Keegan, you had a comment. Yeah. Um, so if you think about it, a lot of, I, I won't say for every person, but a lot of people or some people that take these admin assistant or administrative assistant positions are just, start, I, I'm not making this assumption for everyone, but I know that some of them are taking these positions as to start their career or start their 
or to begin their work career. And so um, usually, like I know a lot of people I talk to at the U of R, they took administrative assistant positions for a year and then they got a, uh, promoted to another position in their unit. And so I don't think, so while I agree with you, Zal, that there might be some issues, but I think that, I don't think we, well, I think that we wouldn't want to have um, um, a, like a one year or one, uh, like a, I don't know. I don't remember what you said if, to be in permanent staff, but I do think that if you, I think that if there was a way where we could have these positions, um, like you said, so maybe like a two or whatever year thing that that would be more beneficial because if people are starting their, I just think that'd be something we want to do rather than always, because like Zhao and others who are going to be um, on the executive, just like you guys know how much time, how much time and effort it takes to do a, a hiring process. So if you do that every year or every uh, year, then yeah, okay. And then, so that's my comment. Awesome. I'm loving the conversation. I also think that there is something, uh, maybe this is just my personal kind of interest, but student employment and student experience. Um, so like out in the big, bad world outside of university, we see a lot of ch different challenges um, for students getting jobs. So having that experience like during university would be cool. And if Ursu could provide that, that'd be cool. But um, there's definitely pros and cons. And I think we're covering both sides like really well. But Eric, you had another contribution. Um, to add on to Keegan's kind of statement about like terms and things like that, in my opinion, I believe that putting a specific kind of term in an employment contract is very deterrent to applicants. And I think this might lead to some problems with what if you have an applicant who actually really does like this job and they end up graduating, they stay in this position if it's just a regular URSU position and you're losing out on that based on the fact that they're limited to certain ter um, terms. I mean, there's a lot of things that we can write into an employment contract that obviously it's not we, but are like lawyers and things like that that will address these concerns. But I think the best thing is um, to kind of just all in all, I think it's a good position that we should hire, but I think there should be a lot more discussion in terms of like an employment contract, but that doesn't really get down to governance per se. That's more just the um, everyday workings of Ursu. So. Of course. And I think that like this conversation is related to governance because we're trying to figure out if this should be like a, con a position within our articles of incorporation. Um, so just wearing those pros and cons is really important. And um, Tiff has a comment. And then right after, I hope we can talk about, say, an AVP position for a specific um, uh, like demographic or group of students on campus. Um, and we did have that really insightful comment of style about getting those details. But um, Tiff, oh. Yeah, um, so I just wanted to kind of um, over, uh, provide an overview. So. We're, we're discussing in a governance and then under executive committee, there should be someone or um, some people, more than one, uh, to help executives to carry out some of the work. Um, to do that, um, you are, what you're providing the, as a salary, it's not gonna be something that a permanent worker would choose to do. For example, if someone is uh, finishing their degree and they're getting for probably le less, it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of part-time or full-time either way positions. Like they're getting paid probably $30,000 per year and they wouldn't choose to get the same amount when they graduate, right? They would want to have a permanent kind of a living wage so that they can uh, contribute. So we're looking, looking at student labor, um, kind of uh, student employment and supporting the executive as when they're being a member of the uh, union. So this is something to probably dis um, kind of discuss um, since we are, um, Kind of since uh, this position related to governance, it is important that uh, we also support student employment and, and then uh, appointing the members uh, or electing the members, whatever uh, uh, we end up getting in. And um, according to that, we can set up a uh, you know, employment contract or whatever contract we create. And um, I just might provide an example. So uh, recently the executives had an opportunity to visit with some other student unions. And um, so we visited 
AMS located at UBC, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Zale, but they had four executives and each executive had two or three associate vice presidents that worked with them. So for example, uh, we were at a summit that was completely organized by one of the associate VPs that fell under the VP external. So while the VP external was kind of the lead, um, somebody that was directly doing that work to uh, create this event was that was like their specific job, for example. Um, and within that portfolio, there had been a different, a couple other different positions that would relate to external kind of goings on. Uh, so, um, and just off the top of my head as president, I could say, um, have like an AVP communications because as president, I do the public speaking. Um, so potentially having someone to, a little bit of assistance writing uh, speeches or uh, following up in kind of the public relations area of that. And then say like an AVP governance to help me uh, stay up to date with the policies and processes um, are, uh, yeah. So those are just like ideas of kind of what the AVPs as well as an example of what we've seen in other areas. But Eric, go ahead. Um, to further add to your kind of uh, discussion with um, AVPs, I think that, for example, even in like the VP student affairs position, we could have that as an umbrella term and then two AVPs perhaps under that position. It's, for example, such as uh, the uh, associate VP of domestic student affairs, and international student affairs and things like that, because I think sometimes it'll be hard to dive to uh, allocate your resources efficiently in terms of trying to um, really relate to students and things like that. And it would be very beneficial if you have certain groups of students that are representative of them, because then you have more engagement. And then also the actual um, VP of student affairs has a lighter workload. And I think all around it would be a very beneficial approach. Awesome. Or even under student affairs, uh, Zeo works, okay, Zeo works on a lot of things, but um, for example, student clubs is something that he does work on. Uh, and he also does work on different academic aspects. So those are two different things, but both under his portfolio, but potentially there's like a way for say an AVP to um, assist him in both of those different areas. Or maybe we need even a VP academic, but Zayo, you had a comment, go ahead. Yeah, so like, uh, yeah, like for my scope, like my current scope, I definitely uh, like uh, in charge of uh, some academic appeals or academic like uh, advocacy and also uh, like, the, uh, like the engagement with uh, student clubs and also some certain programs. Uh, so I, yeah, if you want to start from VP student affairs, you definitely, is either you can establish some new AP position or just establish from AP student fair and below it will be AVP academic and AVP uh, advocacy and AVP maybe sustainability. Then we'll just separate, separate my responsibility very well into three categories. Yeah. So I'm getting a sense that we would want to explore the possibility of AVPs um, within port the different uh, executive positions. Um, and then we've also kind of established that we want to look into how to manage that workload. Um, but Eric, you had a comment and then we will move on to how power is distributed as well as elections and referendums. But go ahead, Eric. I'm gonna bring forward a kind of annoying counter argument, but also, I mean, if we try to be too ambitious in our approach of AVPs, I think we're, we might run into some problems because I mean, there's a huge problem with even the board of directors where there's vacancies within positions. So I think it would be better off to start off small, perhaps maybe one AVP per position. And then we just kind of do it on a case by case basis. So if we're noticing that we have problems with them, if the workload is still too heavy and falls unequally on one individual, then we can kind of look at adding more AVPs because I think it is very beneficial to have different AVPs such as one for Zeo for like sustainability and things like that and academics and all that. But are we gonna run into problems where the positions are vacant or 
there's just too many positions because I know there is an argument that sometimes if government and things like that gets too big, then it's kind of a disaster in itself. It's a balancing act all in all. Absolutely. And oh, it's also interesting to consider that um, we executives would kind of turn into managers. Um, and while I really love working with people, I don't want to have to like manage people and be like, why aren't you at work or that kind of stuff. And I think that might happen a little bit with AVPs because someone would need to provide them like proper employment support because everybody deserves to have like a manager or like some sort of boss that gives them direction and feedback and guidance and opportunities. Um, so very interesting aspects. And um, we lost TAF just for a moment, but we are going to be moving, uh, and then he'll change the slides when he comes back. Um, but we're going to be talking a little bit how power is distributed. Uh, and so it feels weird to like talk about power in this way, but um, so here's the couple prompts that he had that will show on. Oh, there he is. Um, so we're just talking about power. So if you, oh, perfect. So checks and balances uh, and the board versus management. Um, Yes, so we are responsible for, we serve members and there's about 16,000 of them. So that's a lot of people that are looking to us for support. And that's also a lot of people that pay uh, fees to Ursu. So that means we have like money from 16,000 people that we need to be held accountable to. So um, how do we make sure that there's checks and balances in that we are doing right by our members? So that's kind of the first aspect there. And then the role of the board versus management. So I had briefly touched on this during the presentation, but the board provides high level oversight. Uh, strategic direction and planning and uh, performance metrics and making sure that um, and then kind of controlling and overseeing once they've provided a direction and then um, the management side they get direction from the board and then they synthesize what they need to do and then they carry out those actions with the help of their staff and then at like I guess the end of the day, management needs to be held accountable to the board. So providing like updates and reports and feedback on what has happened. But again, this is high level. Um, so management won't go and say, oh, um, I have my, sorry, I'm trying to think of an example off the top of my head, but management wouldn't come and say, oh, um, the customer service representative took one day off. That's not the type of information the board needs to know. They need to know bigger scale um, and it's kind of like almost a summarized version. But the board needs to make sure that management is doing, um, carrying out the actions that the board has kind of led us in. But also management are experts in their fields, okay? Um, so we have a couple uh, different staff on the call today. So while the board says, can reach out and say, we need better student engagement and um, explore a couple different opportunities. So that would be communicated to our marketing manager. And then the marketing manager and uh, their staff, such as the graphic designer and social media coordinator, they would figure out the specific actions to make it happen. So they would pick the color of the poster. They would probably discuss the theme with executives, um, but the board is high level, management is day to day, and it's the board's responsibility to ensure management is getting stuff done. And Ursu is very, okay, I'm talking a lot, but Ursu, put up your hand if you have an idea and want me to stop. But Ursu is very interesting because we have um, the executives who sit on the board, but are also part of like the management and operations side. So that is like, a little bit unique because how can 
we fully watch what we're doing as we need to like it gets my head in a tangle sometimes but we need to watch what we're doing as executives but when we're on the board and so um perhaps we can talk about like the division of how that works because if um the board and management or operations get too into each other it can get messy and how can we ensure um, accountability stuff and yes there's a couple other things there but i'm very open for comments or questions on how power and accountability is going thanks so much for joining us keegan we really value your perspectives But TF, did you have anything to elaborate on to incite some conversations around power distribution? Um, yeah, uh, well, I can probably a little bit expl explain a little bit more. Sorry, it's the end of the day, so my words are getting scrambled together. Um, so checks and balances is very important for any organization, especially non profit organization. When, and, um, organization like uh, Students Union, uh, that when we are very young people, very new to um, you know different things, for example, budgeting, uh, finances, uh, and responsibilities. So it's, it's just really hard to uh, maintain the chance of balance between the departments and then and then uh, individual as well. Um, so any idea for right now how we checks and balance our board um, uh, is a is an ultimate decision maker, but as well as we also. Um, provide some of the direction to the management, um, even if uh, there is no need or there is need. So um, uh, how do we think about uh, giving some sort of authority over management over some issues uh, and not board not controlling over them or not even doing something unless something big happen when then board can in interfere. Um, that, that can um, uh, that has a pros and cons as well. Uh, pros would be uh, management will have more authority and more time and flexibility in terms of making some of the decision and it's going to be efficient uh, and not everybody will come and jump and say hey you shouldn't be doing this blah 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 um, but also there's the cons right um, so uh, we need to to cover up the cons we need to uh, maintain some sort of checks as well and then kind of making sure that it, it has balanced uh, properly uh, and that um, that's where come um, our executive committee. Um, they're responsible. They're representative from the board, and they also represent uh, the board all, all across the operation and management. And they make sure the management is in line with what boards want and uh, what boards want for for their members. Um, so kind of like you know, uh, how do we make it more efficient while serving the students in terms of services? advocacy and lots and lots of other um, political actions uh, that we're taking on in, in near future. Um, uh, yeah, and also some of the uh, main um, aspects of the Students Union or any organization is the HR uh, department, um, our um, hiring, our firing, all of these HR matters and making sure that we're providing an, a good environment to our staff, to our students, um, to everyone and making sure that we're standing as a good union um, and we're, we're also uh, with QP uh, local uh, 1486, making sure we're having a rela good relationship with the uh, um, local union. Um, uh, also, we have uh, different committees like governance committees. We have a committee uh, who takes care of the, some of the policies and some of the bylaws, but also, you know, policy and the bylaws are very big things for organization. And when students like uh, me, uh, I'm not very well educated, for example, and, and lots of other students are not very well educated when they I get to um, decide and change a lot of the bylaws and policy every year. Um, after five years and six years, you just miss or you just lost, uh, lose a lot of things from the original bylaws and then things get a little bit messier at some point. Uh, so there is something other things to discuss about. Um, yeah, I think I've talked too much so you can start discussing these issues. You did not talk too much. Um, we can start hearing from Nick. What, what are you thinking? Well, as far as the board versus administration dynamic is concerned, um, I feel that it's the board's um, 
the board is responsible for the ideas, you know, coming up with a plan um, and approving via oversight the things that um, administration does. But the, the goal of administration is to actually get it done. So the board's the idea, the administration's getting the actual work done. Um, but the board also needs to ensure that the administration is getting the work done. And you do that through clear and concise policy, which can be referenced back um, and committees. But there is a distinction too, because they are elected positions um, with the board, you don't necessarily get um, the type of experience that is required to um, do the administrative work. And that's one of the reasons why you have segregation like that. Um, because you, you know, you may think, oh, it's just a student's union, but as far as nonprofits are concerned and businesses as a whole, our operation is extremely complicated. Um, so to assume that someone with not a lot of experience can come in and, and ensure that we're, we're you know, crossing all, all the T's and, and dotting the I's and ensuring that we're compliant with all our financial policy or not finan our policy and our um, go other governing documents would be a little bit naive. Um, and, but that's why you do need that segregation, and that's why you do need, um, uh, you know, professionals with experience and education, um, basically pulling off that that vision. Um, so it's it's important to keep that separated. But at the end of the day, you know, looking at that stuff like this, uh, our governance, our policies, and whatnot, it has to be written in a way that is clear and concise for the end user. Um, that the rules that we live by um, are easily accessible and understood by um, everyone in the organization from the board to administration. And that those, those rules are, 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 are those, those roles, sorry, are clearly defined. Um, so, you know, board members aren't overstepping, administration isn't overstepping, but it's very important to understand that, that dynamic and ensure that, um, you know, administration is, you know, qualified and competent to, to uh, pull it off. And yes, it is very complicated. You know, if you look at the OWL, for instance, most um, restaurants in the world are not run by a student's union. That's a, a separate business in itself. Um, plus, we do all the advocacy. Um, we're administering, you know, student levies for 18 different things. It's, it's quite complicated. Um, so, you know, important to keep in mind, but also, important that we, we clearly segregate this stuff. Absolutely. And I might just use another example as well. So the board does not um, create the financial statements. Our accounting team does, but the board needs to review those financial statements to make sure that we are meeting our uh, goals and uh, adhering to the previously approved budget. So um, working in tandem and that kind of reporting structure is important. See. But that is also one of the issues too, is a lot of the time with an elected board that doesn't have a lot of experience is you trust those people that have, have been hired to do it. Um, when I present budgets, when I present financials to, to the board, I rarely have questions and it breaks my heart because I really want people to be engaged. And I appreciate the fact that, you know, the numbers that I'm presenting and how I present them are respected and whatnot. But it's very important that we have an active, engaged board who do ask those questions, who do um, ensure that they are in alignment, right? It, it shouldn't be, uh, it's not fair to me or the board to, or, or the GM for that matter, to put all that burden on one person and assume that it's correct all the time. And in fact, that sort of assumption um, can create a lot of uh, potential problems in the future. Okay, so I want to keep talking about how this works. Does anyone have more thoughts? Uh, maybe I'll provide, oh. Can I just answer the tech support um, question about mm -hmm. the audit? Uh, yeah, sure. 
an auditor uh, will not find everything. They they do provide reasonable assurance that it's in accordance with GAAP and, and the regulations in our country. Um, but the thing is, if something bad happens and the board didn't look at it and the auditor found it, we've got big problems. Yeah. And also auditing is one of those like hindsight is 2020 situations, I think. Um, because <laughs> once someone's audited it, it, it could be too late. Um, so, uh, Talha, you had some comments. Yeah, I mean, something I thought I'd mention to you folks as you go through this governance process is one of the big things that I, I've emphasized to folks, and I've been through two governance processes at other student unions, uh, is when we talk about checks and balances, we also need to talk about uh, our our structure for governance. Uh, governance exists on a spectrum. If you look at the Carver model, which is one of the more popular nonprofit uh, governance models, it, it relies on policy governance. Policy governance is something which creates very defined roles. The board is specifically governed through policy rather than anything else. So board only passes policies and other duties as assigned, but primarily their role is to create policies and those policies are then implemented by administration. The thing for us as a student union, and something that's cool about nonprofits in, in a way is that while we are limited in how we can change our structures, you know, we can't be like a co-op because we're a nonprofit. So we can't be a cooperative student union. We can't be a student union that's designed too much like a labor union because we're not the same type of organization. But we do have spaces where we can come up with creative things. So for example, uh, board engagement can be on a spectrum of like, very involved to not involved at all, like the policy governance I mentioned. And that's something that you folks as the students can kind of figure out what you want. Like how much engagement on a board level is A, important, but also is sustainable. One of the things that I, I think is an issue at many student unions is we give people a bunch of, of roles and we say, this is your job. And it's like 10 different things. And then you have to figure out how you do 10 different things. And obviously no one can do 10 different things all at once. So creating spaces for people to understand what their role is, how they should be engaging and what their role is. So for example, something I thought that was cool that Eric mentioned is the idea of being an arts director that actually represents students, uh, which we don't push as much. A role for a director could be to hold town halls or to hold similar kind of conversations like we're having now among the students that they represent um, or, other, or other tools that they could use. So Finding ways to incorporate the student engagement and member relation side of our roles might be a cool way of doing it. I'm not going to suggest what those should be. I think you folks are on campus. You can figure out ways to best engage your students or our members. And uh, that might be another thing to explore as you're talking about checks and balance and powers and things like that is also looking at what folks should be doing and how we engage with our membership. Thanks so much, Talha. Does anyone have any questions on this topic of uh, power and divisions of power and how that works? Maybe it's a little bit less familiar to talk about for some of us, which is A-OK. -okay. But if there's questions, we can help figure it out together. Um, but we, uh, TAF also has included here uh, committee versus individual power. And um, TAF can elaborate more, but I just wanted to address um, Ursu's board committees. So we have like seven committees um, off the top of my head. And right now those committees cannot make like binding decisions. So committees are set out to provide like specialty and expertise. Uh, so it's a subset of, it's almost like a finger. If a, if a board was a hand, a committee is a finger. And so they help do specific things like 
like this, or I don't know. Uh, but so the committees do specific work and then they report back to the board. And with how we are now, committees can provide recommendations and suggestions and like expertise. But at the end of the day, the board has the final decisions. So that's also another aspect of say decision-making and power. Um, yeah. So right now we have um, an HR committee, we have a governance committee, and those are, and we also have a finance committee and an investment committee and equity, diversity and inclusion and digital advisory. And there's different areas. Oh, thank you so much for joining us, Eric. Have a really good weekend. And yeah, so a lot of different committees that help provide expertise to the board, but at the end of the day, they don't make those decisions themselves. But if that prompts anyone to share some thoughts, let me know. But perhaps TAF has another way to phrase this aspect. Yeah, um, the committees versus uh, individuals. So uh, I can give you an example, walk through the example. For example, um, maintaining a good governance is very important for any organization. Um, so uh, we have a governance committee, for example, related to work, related to governance, right? Um, so whether we should, uh, like committees are great, but sometimes when you're having uh, different you know, students and members in the committees, um, um, giving them some kind of workload and then meeting them, like, you know, uh, scheduling a meeting and then things get a little bit more um, complicated at some point of life, because as a student, probably we're the busiest team in group on the art. Uh, so, uh, and some, some of the department needs some stable um, communication, some stable work. So um, should we be looking at someone, um, uh, you know, having someone to do some of the work with related, you know, uh, with some, um, uh, you know, help from the directly from the board or committee, or should it be appointing committee and let them do some of the work? For example, right now is the governance. Uh, we can talk about um, other departments. For example, we're doing an advocacy and campaigns. Should we be leading um, all of the ideas coming from a committee, or should I? Uh, should we give the power to one individual to navigate and lead all of these programs? Um, so there, there are pros and cons in both sides. Um, so whatever is best uh, in our governance structure, uh, we can discuss a uh, little bit more about that uh, within our capacity right now. And I just wanted to give you another information. Um, we're taking all of this um, conversation and a lot of the a lot of the ideas will be um, analysis uh, and then they will come from different um, research. Um, so after making the first draft, um, and then within these ideas, we'll have to uh, plan through policies and bylaws. Um, and then after you know creating a first uh, draft of the every every single things, you will have more idea uh, about different different things. Right now we're just going all over the place. Um, if you're confused about some of the things, I will encourage you to wait a little bit until the January, and then you will be given information with pros and cons and why we're coming with this idea, uh, where this idea come from, and then what, what kind of bylaws we're going to establishing around these ideas um, to make sure that. Um, uh, we're, we're running efficiently. And I wanna um, and address another thing. Um, in, in, in my capacity as a, as a, as a staff, uh, I just also am a member. So I see both sides and I just wanna ensure that whatever I'm working on, whatever the, our committee is working on, making sure whatever we create, uh, make it more concise, um, you know, clear for our students to understand. It's not something we're just gonna make a tough bylaws and no one would be able to understand and no one would be able to interpret them. But we, we wanna fill those gaps as well as fill the gaps of education and training throughout the year. So no one is coming to the board and feeling like uh, they haven't been trained well uh, and they haven't been uh, you know, educated well enough to navigate some of the issues and run the board or um, having a good input in the board and effort. So that's, that's all for me now. Thanks so much, TF. Perhaps as we get closer to the end of our time today, we could touch on elections and referendums briefly. Um, so elections are currently how we pick our executives as well as how we pick our board of directors. 
And um, I might need a little bit of help explaining referendums in the specific student union context, but referendums are a specific question that we ask membership on, say, a new service we provide or a new process. And so this is voted on by our members during elections. Um, and some of us may have heard about the the recent um, referendum in Alberta, um, but we won't talk about that. But in the student union context, say a referendum to provide direction for the organization, and then it's voted on. And it's just like a single question. Um, I believe last year or two, no, last year it was a question around Proctor Track that was kind of presented of, as a referendum, but that's not how it usually works. But Tayf, do you have maybe a 20 second explanation yeah. of what a referendum I can is? Yeah, sure, I can explain. Thank you, your explanation. So uh, there's a two type of question you can ask in the in a um, in a um, election, uh, and then that uh, either is a one is referendum questions and another is plebiscite questions. So plebiscite question is the action based question. For example, we want to um, strike um, at, the, at the University of Virginia to freeze the tuition. This, is, this could be a plebiscite question. And if membership um, vote on and approve this and a majority of the vote cast it, then we can go ahead with the strike. And referendum question is related to levy fee. So for example, you were, um, a, a, for example, ARPARG, uh, probably, let's think ARPARG doesn't exist and so some group of students wanted to uh, um, you know, introduce an ARPARG as a student center, then they will present the referendum question, should ARPARG be given $2.5 per semester uh, and, and then be a student center. So um, referendum is related to levy fee and then plebiscite related to action, um, if that makes sense. That was perfect. Thanks, Tayf. Well, actually, I think it was perfect, but um, obviously I'm still learning a little bit. But does anyone have any comments on how we have elections? So that's how we pick um, our uh, people that are leading the organization or referendums. And I think that it is important that we make elections accessible to everyone. Do you think that with our current process, is there any sort of like inherent barriers for people to run in an election? Is that a concern for anyone? We want like any member out of the whole organization, any of the 16,000 people should have an opportunity to run in an election if that's what they wanted. But what is preventing people from running in elections? Is there something? Um, or for a referendum, um, for a referendum to pass, um, maybe Tayev can provide more details on what we would need for a referendum to pass, but should we have um, 10,000 people agree to pass a referendum or should we have 50 people to pass a referendum? Like perhaps, um, yeah. So that's another consideration. But TAF, is that addressed in the Nonprofit Corporations Act or is that gonna be in our governing documents? Um, on top of my head, uh, I cannot comment how detailed it is addressed, uh, but um, I, I think it's more related to governance and, uh, and then things. So it might not be in detail in the Nonprofit Corporation Act 1995. Uh, but um, a referendum uh, or plebiscite question, um, the process is uh, uh, in our current bylaws, um, uh, two, two group of people can address uh, uh, to the board, uh, you know, start initiate this. One is board of directors or uh, with the recommendation of the executive. Uh, so they don't need to go and get a, a signature and petition from the members. They can directly introduce a, a referendum to the SGM or AGM and then membership has to pass the referendum question or plebiscite question to be in the election. So um, membership has a chance to you know, vote on whether this referendum question or plebiscite question should be in the election process, election. 
And there's other way, if a member uh, wants to introduce their friend or, or, or plebiscite, they have to get a certain amount of, a certain number of signature from the membership. I believe, uh, I, I cannot comment if I do wrong, uh, you know, I don't wanna comment is how percentage, but probably Talha can say, but there is this percentage of people that uh, needs to sign the petition. And those, those petitions should be um, with, uh, with an after documentation should be uh, submitted to the board of directors and board of directors will uh, overview and they will call a, um, a AGM to put their referendum or plebiscite uh, to be voted on. If the referendum question or plebiscite are defeated in the AGM or SGM, they're not gonna be introduced in the election. If they're being, um, uh, uh, you know, um, um, if, if people, uh, what's the word? <laughs> uh, if, if, if the referendum or plebiscite question are carried out, then um, um, the students union will, um, will, or CRO will put this um, question into the, into the election process. And um, that is how it works. I think Talha can provide a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. So the, there are two streams there and both of them involve two bodies. So the, and it goes back to who's the ultimate decision-making body of our suit, uh, which we have two. We have the board of directors and it's sort of above the board of directors is the special general meeting or annual general meeting. So the process is uh, either uh, you can have the executive committee propo can propose questions to the board of directors for inclusion in general elections or as a separate referendum. Some schools, you know, most schools will have their referendum questions or their questions to students in their general elections. Some might do them separately as well. You know, you might have one in September or you might want to have one before the, the general elections or after that that's always a possibility. Um, so that's one process. The executive committee can propose to the board of directors. The board of directors can just come up with a referendum on its own. Uh, or if a student wants to collect a petition, they can collect 5% uh, of, uh, 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 like a petition of 5% of the members of Versu, which is students, um, and bring that petition to the board. And then if that's approved by a two thirds majority vote of the board, uh, that can be sent uh, to, uh, to, a, to, to, to the students through an election or referendum or they can bring such a petition to an annual general meeting uh, once again. And if that's approved, uh, it, it will go to the elections. Or if a motion is passed at an annual general meeting for a referendum, that can also cause a referendum to be triggered. So there's a lot of different ways that we could have a referendum. Referendums are a really cool way to engage students in direct democracy um, and, and members in direct democracy. So having uh, different ways for folks to do it is always better, giving more options for folks uh, within reason. Uh, you don't want situations where like groups are targeted through referendums or things like that. Um, but there, there are a lot of, so if anybody has an idea, there are a lot of ways where a student could create, a, like bring a referendum question forward. And if you want more details, you can check out the elections and referendum bylaw uh, on our website in the governance section. This is section 3.3, specifically 3.3.1, uh, uh, which is calling a referendum. Thank you so much, Talha and Tf. It's a little bit tough to keep my eyes open talking about a referendum on a Friday afternoon. Um, so that might be what the problem is. It's a lot to wrap your head around, I find, with some of the governance stuff. But once you have it kind of in your understanding, you're going to be just as passionate about it as TF and Talha and myself. I'm getting there, but you can see them both wanting to talk about referendums a lot because it is exciting for people to give very specific direction and that kind of engagement. But we're getting to the end of our time here. So any final, oh, any final comments or questions? And it can be in relation to something we talked about specifically today, or it could be about um, like other Ursu things or the next opportunity to give your feedback. And I'm going to just grab the link for our governance for more details. And I'll throw it in the chat quickly because we want to keep engaging and hearing from you. So we have details at this link. 
Yeah, so a couple things there. Comments, questions, I'm really open to it. So our next steps here uh, for this process, um, just, I guess, going back to kind of the timeline, uh, we are going to be starting to draft a proposal. So we have been meeting with individual members, we've been meeting with different groups, we have been meeting with you all here today at the town hall. And so we're going to be drafting and also doing some analysis and following up on some of your ideas. So that's going to be great. And then um, still doing more consultations because your voice is very important to this process and making sure that URSU fits your needs. So that's a priority here. We're going to be drafting and then, um, yeah, having another town hall on January 11th which if I am correct, is going to be um, another feedback session on our draft. Right, Tiff? Yes. Yeah, so uh, January 11th, we're gonna be creating um, a draft for everything we have talked about, um, every single problem that we have, and we're gonna address them with a solution. And then we're gonna talk in details about whether you like it or not like it, because ultimately we wanna pass those a recommendation from the members. And if we had have an opportunity um, uh, before, you know, going to the membership to address some of the things, uh, we would love to work with that. And I really, really encourage uh, everyone to join the, the second town hall. It's gonna be more cohesive, like you will have information in front of you and we're gonna present um, in, in details possible. And we're gonna try to make, uh, break it down to one topic to one topic. Uh, the January uh, 11 is gonna be a little bit longer session uh, because we'll have a lot of information to talk about. And um, 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 it's, it's the first week of probably uh, our semester, so we'll have more time to talk. And then we're uh, probably planning through uh, having this town hall um, in person if everything goes well, if the pandemic is okay with us. Uh, and then we might even have some fun things, um, uh, probably some food, some more uh, social chats. Um, we'll plan through and let you know. So our um, uh, wursu.ca slash governance, you will get all the information about the town hall. Thank you. Okay, so with that, I'll stay on for 30 seconds here. Um, no, I'll stay on for a minute, just in case someone wanted to hang out and ask me a question. But that is the end of our consultation today. Make sure to stay in touch. Um, so, and thank you so much for joining us. And great luck, or good luck on finals. Um, not that you need it. I'm sure that we're all prepared and ready for that but I'll just stay on as we wrap up and let me know if there's any questions. And I really, really appreciate everyone joining us.